Hi, PJ Scott here, your Navy Waves veteran with another edition of Veterans Forum. And today I'm really pleased to have a chaplain with us. I don't think this is the first time I've had a chaplain, although he's the real McCoy. Uh, many of you might remember where I did a program years ago with the four chaplains in the Dorchester that went down in the Atlantic during World War II. Many veteran service organizations uh, celebrate yearly the courage of the four chaplains. But my chaplain is here in living color, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Father Wesley Clare. Welcome to Veterans Forum. Thank you. It's good now, to see you. Now, you're a chaplain of the California... I'm with the California National Guard. And uh, I have two hats, actually. I'm the wing chaplain for the 144th Fighter Wing mm -hmm. uh, here in Fresno. Mm -hmm. And uh, they fly the F-15s for air defense. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, uh, my other hat is the state chaplain, uh, working directly with the Adjutant General, General Baldwin, oh, okay. uh, at Joint Forces Headquarters in Sacramento. Okay, so you are a very busy man buzzing all over California. <laughs> and I have a church in the little town of Tehachapi. Oh, okay. Uh, down south up by Bakersfield. Right, right. Well, before we get into your duties, let's get a little background on you because here at Veterans Forum we like to have people, or I do, that you're a whole person. You're not just some person in combat and that's the only thing you did and buy in so long. I like to do the whole veteran. So you didn't just spring forth as a chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, give us a little background about your childhood and well, so sure. forth. Sure. Well, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. uh, my hometown, a little farm town of Wenatchee, okay. Washington, and then okay. my uh, high school and junior high years were in uh, Olympia, Washington. Okay. I uh, went to Washington State University and, and graduated from Evergreen State College in Olympia. Uh -huh. um, went ROTC. Uh, mm -hmm. And immediately from uh, for finishing my degree in computer science, went off to uh, flight school at Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento. Oh, okay. Uh, where I was uh, trained to be a navigator. Okay. Uh, specialized in electronic warfare. Uh huh. Uh, it's this interesting world, uh, aircraft navigation. Yeah. It's kind of informal. You take the geek test. If you know too much uh, science fiction trivia, you flunk and you end up going to electronic warfare where all the particular okay. people go. Uh huh. But I uh, uh, ended up uh, in the B 52. Mm -hmm. uh, trained at Castle Air Force Base in Merced, California, and my operational uh, service was at uh, Wurtsmith Air Force Base in Oscoda, Michigan. Okay. And while I was stationed in Michigan, I was uh, involved with the uh, nuclear deterrence uh, uh, work there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had aircraft cocked on alert 24-7. Uh, uh, for, uh, for us, we were on a assigned air crew, and every third week, uh, we'd be back in jail pulling nuclear alert and uh -huh. babysitting the aircraft with the weapons uh, right. out there. And um, we uh, uh, worked that enterprise for uh, quite a few years and then uh, Desert Storm came. Mm -hmm. And um, my crew was one of those selected to deploy. Mm -hmm. uh, we did an employee deploy, which meant we took off about three in the morning in the middle of a blizzard in Michigan with a jet full of weapons uh, heading right. straight for Iraq, uh -huh. nonstop from Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, we recovered it in Saudi Arabia. We spent the rest of the war at Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Altogether, we flew about 25 combat missions uh, in that campaign. Oh, wow. Uh, logged about 129 combat hours. So uh, is this when you and, got uh, tight with Jesus? If they were shooting <laughs> back, frequently my guests don't even think about Jesus until they realize, my God, I could get killed here. Uh, actually, <laughs> I was probably doomed to, do, to, to be an Anglican priest from the time I was in third grade because okay. when I was a young kid growing up in a little town of Wenatchee uh, we'd have you know dirt, dirt cloud fights with the neighbor uh, kids and they uh, made me the chaplain then. <laughs> <laughs> so you were appointed was, by the neighborhood children. So huh? I, I spent all my uh, years trying to run away from the uh, uh, pastoral career and do my dream job of flying airplanes right, and really right. the whole time I was flying I was doing pastoral care for my fellow air crew when we're pulling alert and when we're in we're the alert facility. We're staying there, uh, you know, surrounded by barbed wire and electric fence and teenagers with machine guns, well, and we're living there. And people have their marriages that can get a little tricky or, or, right. or other problems at home, and right. I'm the guy that they would always come to and talk uh -huh. to. And, uh -huh. and so the whole reason it seemed that God had placed me in that flying career was to, to care for my fellow aircrew. 
and, and to let you know where you were really supposed to be. And it seems, yeah. And, uh -huh. and then uh, we had a chaplain that uh, was just phenomenal during Desert Storm, mm -hmm. uh, Father Eric Fenton. And he, was, uh, he was our chaplain there at Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He mm -hmm. was with the National Guard from Montana, mm -hmm. uh, got activated for the war, and mm -hmm. was assigned to our unit. And, and uh, he single-handedly saved probably three or four people from uh, uh, potentially suicide and yeah. certainly a good handful of marriages. Right. Uh, just an amazing man. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, just seeing God working through him right. uh, built in me a debt of gratitude. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it was a catalyst uh, for me to uh, make the moves out of the cockpit, if you will, uh -huh. into the pulpit. Uh -huh. I didn't go immediately into the chaplain corps. Uh, I hung up my wings back in 1992. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time I was a tactics instructor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was busy teaching uh, air crew how to survive the Soviet Navy. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. But we, uh, we hung that up and, and uh -huh. uh, uh, I went off to uh, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, paid the bills as a shop mechanic fixing cars and uh -huh. also going to, to uh, a seminary, uh, got a Master of Divinity. Uh, and, and so do I assume you used your GI Bill, Father? I did. I've always encouraged you to <laughs> use your GI Bill. That's a, you know, I was a patriotic young Amen. woman in 71, but that carrot was the GI Bill. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I was ever grateful. I, I did get my college degree. Oh, yeah. Degree. There, yeah. There were a couple of blessings. Uh, one was the GI Bill, of course, and the other was, uh, uh, the, at the time, they were looking to, uh, uh, for, they were giving incentives for folks who would volunteer to separate because uh, they had too many navigators at the time, and right. and and, uh, uh, and and it was enough of a, a separation bonus to cover the cost of seminary in addition to the GI Bill, so oh, okay. it worked out. And um, I got ordained back in uh, uh, 1996, mm -hmm. and uh, my first church was in Wyoming. Uh -huh. I served there for about five years. It was marvelous. Uh -huh. And then from there, I uh, went to Fargo, North Dakota, uh, for a little while. Worked uh, as a uh, on staff with uh, with a bishop over there. Uh -huh in the Episcopal Church, and then uh, hooked up with the 119th Fighter Wing in Fargo, North Dakota, mm -hmm. and that was the beginning of my, uh, my uh, service as a chaplain. I see. And, uh, and from there, I ended up uh, in Tehachapi, California, where I got called by a church there. Uh -huh. uh, been there ever since. Uh, started there in 2002. Right. Uh, connected with the 19, uh, 144th Fighter Wing uh, just a few months before uh, Katrina happened. Oh, uh, okay. Back in uh, 05. Right. And um, I've been with the wing ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been the wing chaplain uh, now for probably the last five years. But so. you've really went up the staircase, mm -hmm. if you will. You're in charge of quite a bit just in California State, are you not? Well, it seems the, the boulders keep getting larger. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and uh, uh, I think my operations background, it, it, it certainly helped me know about leadership and how to build plans and programs and, 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 and how to coach uh, other chaplains. And that's, uh, as a wing chaplain, that's a lot of what you do is right. you don't just provide pastoral care for the unit. Uh, you also supervise the pastoral care unit wide, mm -hmm. which means training up the other chaplains that you work with. Right. And it grew from there. Uh, uh, it seems to have gotten the attention uh, back at Joint Forces headquarters. And now I'm, I'm uh, working with... Uh, not just the Air National Guard chaplains throughout the state, but also the Army National Guard chaplains. Mm -hmm. And we also have what's called the State Military Reserve, right. which is a volunteer force, our mm -hmm. California militia. And, and they're all phenomenal uh, members in the chaplain corps. It's both chaplains and chaplain assistants. Uh, the chaplain assistant is the enlisted right. aide for a chaplain. He provides protection for the chaplain when he's out in the field. Uh, he's also a facilitator for ministry. And they're a lot, also very well trained in pastoral care themselves for, right. for certain kinds of interventions that may need to happen. Uh, it's amazing work, and uh, we get to touch a lot of lives. Wouldn't you imagine, now tell me, I'm just guessing, mm -hmm. since there hasn't been a draft in mm -hmm. decades, mm -hmm. and this war required Army National Guards, any kind of uh, state militia mm -hmm. up for active duty in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Iraq, that I would imagine the chaplains and everyone in a state militia is way busier than they would have been 40 years ago. Is yeah. that, am I about right on that? Pretty close. I would <coughs> say the, uh, the state militia is really stateside. They mm -hmm. are, uh, they help fill the gaps as our 
our traditional guardsmen deploy. Right. Uh, we did make a ch uh, an adjustment from what they used to call a strategic reserve, mm -hmm. which is sort of backfill for the active duty, mm -hmm. uh, which is really how it had been for a long time, to what they call an operational reserve. Mm -hmm. uh, today, uh, roughly half of our deployments are filled by, by reservists and National Guardsmen. Right, right. And, and uh, so we're right there in the front lines with the rest of our, our uh, fellow warriors uh, providing the pastoral care where they go. Mm -hmm. um, that's the main distinction between chaplains and, other, and, and, and some of the other helping professions. Right. Is we're right there uh, where they go with them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we provide not just uh, religious accommodation, uh, but also pastoral care. Right. And, and uh, it, so we facilitate, uh, for example, uh, if someone has a marriage that's in trouble, right. we have a lot of training to help with that. If somebody's dealing with uh, combat stress or operational stress, mm -hmm. where they've seen, <coughs> seen too much of certain things, right, right. a lot of tragedies, right. uh, we're someone they can go to to debrief, to, to, to sort through what they've seen so that it may not haunt them quite as heavily as it might otherwise. You know, I'm sure chaplains yeah. since way back when mm -hmm. have always tried to help men who have gone through a really horrible battle, their best bud was blown to pieces, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these things were called uh, battle fatigue and Mm -hmm. Oh, there was another name as well. But it's been known by a lot of things. Yeah, Battle uh, fatigue, it, thousand yard stare. Yeah, but now uh, that we know. Shell shock. Shell shock was the uh, word I was looking for. Post traumatic stress. Yes, now it's called post traumatic uh, stress disorder. Do you get training? Do the modern uh, chaplains get training for that mm -hmm. specifically to know what to look for? And, you know, it's hard to say what to say because sometimes mm -hmm. when you're really uh, at the bottom, words just don't have a whole heck of a lot sure. of meaning at that time. Right. So how do, you, how do they cope with that? I mean, well, what's your training for that a, kind of situation? There's a little bit of a distinction between uh, a combat stress or post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. and what's been diagnosed as a post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. the, the stress can lead to the disorder, mm -hmm. uh, but just because they're suffering the symptoms doesn't mean they actually have the full-blown condition. It can mm -hmm. lead to that. Right. So if we're providing if we, so we have training to identify you know, what, what kind of uh, stressors people are facing, mm -hmm. what are the indicators that they're dealing with, for example, recurrent nightmares and, and uh, eating difficulties or sleeping right. difficulties, those right. sorts of problems. And, and uh, so we know a bit of what to look for. Mm -hmm. uh, often what we do is I, I call it a diffusing Mm -hmm. where you just have a conversation with somebody, help them find a new perspective with what they've gone through, mm -hmm. so that may not haunt them quite the same way. For example, when I was in, uh, uh, I was in Iraq uh, five years ago, mm -hmm. and I, I worked uh, as the flight line chaplain in the night shift. I mm -hmm. also worked as a clinical chaplain at the, at the theater hospital there. Mm -hmm. it, this was a blot. And uh, there were some people with very profound injuries that, that their faces still... Uh, I can still recall them. I can still, you know, that's my combat stress. Sure. It's, it's, those, these, it's these images that, mm -hmm. that uh, really never go away. Right. The main difference, I would say, is that they're no longer unwelcome. These are ghosts, if you will, that, right. that I pray over. Right. Whenever the image comes to mind, uh, there's a peace that comes from resolving it. And uh, part of it is knowing, for example, the dignity of sacrifice. Right. Our, our warriors, they don't, necessarily want sympathy as much as gratitude. I find gratitude is, is a very powerful medicine because I find that a warrior who looks at his service and wondering, gosh, was it worth it? That's unresolved stress. That's, uh, yeah, our Vietnam know. vets know that one very, very exactly. well. Yeah. Very well. And so when I ever meet a Vietnam brother, I always say, welcome back. Glad Amen. You, glad you get back. But, you know, it's only been recently that I was thanked for yeah. my service. And I did not go to Vietnam. I didn't go anywhere. Exactly. San Diego was as close as there I got go. to Vietnam. The thanks and gratitude is, is yeah, huge. it is. And so when I find uh, uh, one of our warriors, for example, who's gone through, uh, say, the death of a colleague, Mm -hmm. someone who's, whose friend died right in front of them, right. and, and then they had to deal with the remains. Right. That's terrible. That's of course. A, and yet, uh, if that person were to realize, well, who would their best friend's mom would want better than them right. to help with that? Right. 
then they realized that this was terrible, this was painful to go through, and yet I did an honorable thing going through that extra measure of suffering on behalf of my, my colleagues' family. And then they can see, I would even see, say a, a, you know, a sense of sacred Exactly. Honor. I mean, this isn't just doing your duty. This is... And this is what we as chaplains can do, is help folks mm -hmm. find a new context for what they've gone through. Right. So that they can say, you know, this hurt terribly, and yet there was honor in it. And because I found the honor in it, it's no longer uh, as, as much of an unwelcome memory as it was, mm -hmm. because I found the honor in it. Right. And, and, and uh, that's, that's a lot of the, that's one of the more effective ways we can help folks to, to find uh, peace with what they've seen. Mm -hmm. and, and then I'll, I'll also describe uh, the, the privilege of the wounded healer, mm -hmm. uh, where we turn our, our pain into ministry. Um, someone who's gone through a tremendous trial, uh, and they've endured. Mm -hmm. And they, they bear the scars any time we brush against evil. Right. And when we are out there, there's evil we're contending with. There's villagers we're seeking to save from, from, from bad guys trying to ter do terrible things. Right, right. And, and, and you, you can't contend with evil without facing the scar from it. Right. But when you see uh, the blessing of the folks whom you sought to help, uh, you can recall saying, wow, we did something. We made a difference. We helped some people. Right. That's, then you look at the pain you go through from contending with that evil. And you can say, well, you know, I know there's another guy who's been through the same kind of hardship I've been through. Of course. Or another lady. Right. Folks who've seen and done things that, gosh, uh, we're so grateful our children don't have to. Right. Uh, you know, I think all of us can say that. Sure. When I uh, uh, became... 90% visual loss, mm -hmm. service connected dis mm -hmm. disability, mm -hmm. I thought, well, gee, what am I going to do now? Right. And I did have a pity party for a while, and I, you can correct me, I, I think it's healthy to have a pity party, but you can't linger there, you can't stay there. At some point, you need to move on. Grief is a hotel you check into, y yeah, right. but only for a visit. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's very well put. Yes, that's very well put. And I realized, well, I had done TV in Modesto, California mm -hmm. before I became, was losing vision, mm -hmm. and I thought, this doesn't stop me from talking, there and it go. doesn't wipe out my memories of being in the Navy and all my uncles and told me war stories. I, you know, sure. so I thought, well, I'm gonna, I can talk to veterans yeah. by God, and here I am. There you go. And I'm talking, and you obviously see these sunglasses. So if you have some kind of disability, use it to help someone else. Yeah, that's what resilience. One element to resilience is. Right. Being bouncing back, if you will, is, is finding, uh, okay, I've been through this. All right. I know that there are colleagues, there are brothers and sisters in arms right. who've gone through a similar hardship. Right. They could use a friend who's been there. Right. And, and uh, really that's, I think, what the Ministry of Veterans is, is often about, is, mm -hmm. is folks who found strength that they've needed through the help of a friend mm -hmm. now being a blessing to others in turn. Right. And chaplains were often a catalyst for that. We can help folks kind of reflect on hardships they've gone through and survived, and then they face no longer as victim but survivor, uh, no longer as, as someone who suffered but someone who helps others who are suffering. And, and that renewed purpose is an amazing source of strength, particularly when it's tapped into the faith the one has grown up with. Right. And right. that's where the religious angle or the spiritual intervention right. we bring. Uh, we help folks connect with the faith of their youth. And if there are no faith, we certainly respect that. Um, it's, it's just a means for us to help people tap in to the spiritual strength that is available for them. Do you they find that it. those have some kind of faith do a little better and those that don't, are they interested in getting that faith? I'm sure that's a major variable will be different from person to person to person. Well, exactly. Everyone's different. Right, so, of course. So f there are folks who are pretty uh, uh, steadfast in their convictions one way or another. We, 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 we make sure that that's respected. Right. Uh, there are folks who maybe are searching. Maybe they grew up in a particular religion and they grew away from it uh, uh, in their college days and then they're kind of thinking back about it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we might help them connect with the faith they grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, but because we minister to people of all faith backgrounds of, and of no faith, uh, we just make sure that they're respected and, and uh, uh, that if they're interested in, in some spiritual strength uh, of a religious perspective, we certainly can offer that for them. Now, I want to get back, because I've done several mm -hmm. programs on PTSD. And in mm -hmm. fact, I won a, a very nice award as best program in Washington. I lived mm -hmm. in Washington State for 10 years, oh, yeah. an area. Lots of Navy bases and, yes, the, Army, there are. and the Army <laughs> bases just across the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So there was yeah. no end to veterans. Believe me, yes. that was veterans heaven. Uh, Except you uh, don't really tan there, you rust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At any event, uh, this idea of, because there's people that mm -hmm. are living, there's families, sure. mothers, fathers, wives, husbands in some cases, women go to combat now as well. Mm -hmm. It's a new world. Uh, this bit about honoring them mm -hmm. or what they did was honorable and mm -hmm. even sacred. Mm -hmm. If you're a family member of someone like that, instead of constantly focusing, and it's so easy to focus on the woe is me, because believe me, I was a woe is me. Oh, After sure. 20 laser surgeries, and mm -hmm. I still ended mm -hmm. up. 90% visual loss. Wow. I did a lot of woe is me, so I'm not judging mm. anybody who's woe is me right Understood. now. But I mean, you can't stay there. How could a family member mm -hmm. inject this, what you did was honorable, and mm -hmm. we appreciate it, mm -hmm. and others? Right. Uh, how would they go about that well, to help them in that regard? Yeah. Because well, I never heard that before. That's kind of mind I mean, even it just helps mm -hmm. a little bit. It's a step in the right direction sure. to some kind of, maybe not recovery, but learning to live with it. Well, there's something of the art of the good war story. Mm -hmm. When I share a war story, if you will, mm -hmm. I don't want to celebrate any of my own achievements or anything I've done. Mm -hmm. I want to celebrate my brother or sister in arms. Right. So I will tell their story. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you have a friend uh, maybe he fell in battle. Mm -hmm. And the image of that is, is, is hard to shake. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps instead of running from the pain, we embrace it and, and, and pass through it. We see the purpose, uh, the blessing that person gave. Right. So maybe my, if I had a friend, say, who died in battle, uh, and in my case, I'll even tell a story. There was a, a mission where 12 B-52s we had to strike a target at Taji in Iraq mm -hmm. back in Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a crew flying an F-111 um, Raven, which is a, a standoff jamming aircraft, it was protecting our, our strike package. Right. If it weren't for them, we'd be dead. There were 72 airmen in those B-52s who needed their altitude shielded from the flak and the missiles. Right. These two airmen, these two air crew uh, in this one particular aircraft, uh, they were shot down. They gave their lives. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you, were not for them, I wouldn't be here. And so I tell their story. I right. tell how these men flew at an altitude that was very vulnerable, a lower altitude. But because they were flying there, uh, they gave their lives to save so many more. Yes. And, and that is a uh, example of a tragedy, but uh, uh, one who, who faced the hardship uh, and faced death, but did so willingly because they cared so much for their other brothers in arms at the time. And, and that's an example of telling a, a story, if you will, that commemorates the heroic uh, actions of a colleague who, who uh, maybe fell in battle, but did so with honor. Uh, our, all of us who face combat, we all have such stories, perhaps. Right. And, and so when those memories come up, telling the story of the heroics, mm -hmm. uh, even in the midst of a hard situation, you can always, almost always find at least one, one thing that one person did that others can be grateful for and telling that part of the story. It changes the nature of the memory from being uh, nothing, you know, instead of being just a complete disaster to be something that 
that uh, at least one guy did one honorable thing, or one lady did one I honorable thing. Exceedingly honorable. Exactly. And frankly, I would go on record that folks that make a sacrifice like that yes. for their fellow man exactly. go straight to heaven. And, and, and even if it wasn't someone who had fallen in battle, maybe some other folk had, had faced tragedy, but, but there was somebody who saved someone's life. Right. Or somebody who maybe said or did the right thing or just happened to be at the right place for certain things to work right. out. Right. Telling that part of the story, mm -hmm. I find, is, is powerful medicine in addition to gratitude to, mm -hmm. to uh, help mitigate some of the hard stuff that we've, mm -hmm. the folks have gone through. So, uh, and again, that's, that's the part of our role as chaplains is to help folks connect with that. Uh, for people of faith, seeing where the grace of God uh, was right. evident right. in those situations. And then uh, uh, as, as we deal with the, the stress or the memories, letting those be occasions of prayer mm -hmm. rather than occasions simply of grieving. Right. Um, and, and also connecting and resolving some of the anger that comes. Uh, one of the things that we deal with is, is sometimes people, uh, uh, they get angry when they reflect on hard things or things that weren't oh, right. Oh, oh God, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. translating that into uh, uh, grief instead of acting out on anger, uh, that's another role that we can play, helping folks to, to get to what's behind the anger. And, and well, we uh, have about one minute left. Oh, if there okay. is something yeah. you'd really like to say to folks, this is your chance to say it before we end the program, All right. Father. Well, uh, it's a tremendous privilege to be with you. Thank you. Uh, I would say, uh, uh, remember that the chaplain, uh, uh, we have a lot of the, we do a lot of the same kinds of work that some of our mental health friends do. Yeah. But we come without paperwork. <laughs> 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 we have absolute confidentiality. A service member can come to a military chaplain and it's completely, completely confidential. It, uh, it can't even be asked about by any commander. And that allows us to do a tremendous amount of suicide intervention, rescue a great many marriages. I can't speak of how many marriages we've rescued over these last few years. That's a good point. There's so. no record of it. Yeah, Father so. uh, Claire, it was so wonderful yeah, to so have you on. It's a blessing to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed of this course. program. And if you know someone with PTSD or stressors, remember to honor them. Find the honor and don't focus on the tragedy. This is PJ Scott saying God bless you all. Till next time.